tap number 12 starts out with the parable of the vineyard. We already covered this last week in chapter 11. I kind of grouped this in with the parable of the fig tree just because the topics went together so well. So actually, I'm going to start out in chapter 11, verse 27, because this is something that I didn't get to last week when we did Mark chapter 11. And this is the first uh, of a series of times when the, the Pharisees, the scribes, people come to Jesus and they challenge him. And they challenge his authority or they try to stump him with, with hard questions. And they're going to do this several times in a row. And in verse 27, the Bible reads, They come again to Jerusalem, and as he was walking in the temple, there come to him the chief priests and the scribes and the elders, and say unto him, By what authority doest thou these things? And who gave thee this authority to do these things? And Jesus answered and said unto them, I will ask of you one question, and answer me, and I will tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John, was it from heaven or of men? Answer me. And they reasoned with themselves, saying, If we shall say from heaven, he will say, Why then did you not believe him? But if we shall say of men, they feared the people, for all men counted John that he was a prophet indeed. And they answered and said unto Jesus, We cannot tell. And Jesus answering saith unto them, Neither do I tell you by what authority I do these things. So this is the first in a series of interactions Jesus is going to have with these religious leaders where he gets the better of them every time. He always confounds them. He's always smarter than them. He always turns things around on them. Now, when they come to him and say, by what authority doest thou these things, what things are they talking about? Do you remember from last week what happened in Mark chapter 11? Remember, he flipped over the tables, cast out the money changers, dumped out their money. Now, it would take a lot of boldness to do such a thing, and you can imagine that if you do something like that, someone might question you know, whether you had the right to do that to come in and flip things over and, and cast out all the money changers. So they're coming to him and saying, basically, you know, who do you think you are doing this? What authority or what right do you have to do such a thing? And he says, well, I'll ask you one question. If you can answer it, then I'll tell you the answer. And they say, okay, you know, go right ahead. And he asks them the question, the baptism of John, was it from heaven or of men? Now, John the Baptist was the one who came and preached and, and basically all the people counted John to have been a prophet. In fact, that's why Herod was apprehensive about executing John the Baptist because he feared the people and he knew that the people counted John as a prophet and he didn't want to make them upset, but he ended up executing John because of the oath that he made when Herodias danced before them. But even when John the Baptist was preaching, the scribes and the Pharisees came to be baptized by him, not because they actually believed his message. Because G John the Baptist preached that they should believe on him that should come after. You know, John the Baptist preached about the coming of Jesus Christ. And the Pharisees and scribes didn't even believe John's message, but they showed up to be baptized simply because everyone else was being baptized and they wanted to be accepted of the people and they wanted to fit in and be looked up to and they didn't want to miss the boat of this religious movement that was happening but they had no change of heart. That's why John the Baptist rebuked them and said, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come, bring forth therefore fruits meet for repentance. And think not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. And now also the ax is laid unto the root of the tree. Every tree therefore that bringeth not good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Now, when John the Baptist said that unto the Pharisees and the scribes that came to his baptism, what, is, what he's saying is he didn't, he didn't actually believe that, that anything had changed about their faith, okay? When he said, bring forth therefore fruits, meat for repentance, he's saying, what do you have to show me that you're not the same old Pharisees and scribes and Sadducees that you were yesterday? He knew that they were showing up to be baptized simply because everybody was doing it, not because they'd actually been saved. Now, according to the Bible, the one thing that a person has to do before they get baptized is they have to believe. Now, the great scripture on this, of course, is Acts 8, 37, where the man asks, you know, what doth hinder me to be baptized? What's stopping me from being baptized? And Philip tells him, if thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, 
and then they stopped the chariot and he baptized him. So that's the biblical prerequisite for baptism is believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. And by the way, a baby can't do that. You know, it's not even old enough to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. So you believe, then you get baptized according to the Bible. Well, when John the Baptist is rebuking the Pharisees and telling them, bring forth therefore fruits, meat for repentance, he's rebuking their unbelief. Jesus is later going to tell them over and over again how they don't believe on him. And he says how John came unto you in the way of righteousness and you believed him not. But the, the publicans and the harlots believed him. So the Bible's real clear that the Pharisees and the Sadducees, their problem was that they didn't believe the preaching of John the Baptist. That's why John the Baptist refused to baptize them, okay? A lot of people will try to twist that and say, well, hey, in order to be baptized, you have to show the fruits of repentance, meaning, you know, I want to see a change in your life. And there are some churches that won't let you get baptized right away after you get saved. You know, I just heard from a guy who said, you know, that the pastor found out that he had used drugs and, and basically refused to baptize him because he had used drugs recently. Other uh, churches have said, you know, if a man has long hair, he needs to get a haircut before he can get baptized. Or, you know, hey, if you're living with your girlfriend, you know, you're going to have to get out of that fornication before you can be baptized. And this is very common where churches will put other requirements on baptism other than faith in Christ. Another thing that they'll sometimes do is have a baptism class that can last from four to six weeks. You know, I like what one person said, you know, is the water that deep? You know, that people have to be trained, you know, to be baptized? They need a class on it? But they say, you know, we don't just baptize people right away. You know, you got to make them go through the class and you got to make sure that they're really making changes in their life and blah, blah, blah. The Bible says that when Paul won people to Christ in Acts 16, they were baptized the same hour, which was midnight. I mean, this guy got saved in the middle of the night. Paul baptized him in the middle of the night. And so the Bible teaches that baptism is the first step of obedience, not, you know, later on after you've done a bunch of other obedience, you get baptized. No, the first step of obedience is to be baptized. You know, and if you haven't been baptized, you know, you need to get baptized right away. And, and there's nothing to wait for. Once you're saved, that's the first step of obedience is to get baptized. And, and when we say baptized, we're talking about being dunked underwater, not just, not just you know, kind of sprinkled or whatever, but an actual real baptism uh, where you're actually dunked underwater. Now, the reason I bring this up is because people will say, you know, oh, bring forth therefore fruits, me for repentance. He's saying, you know, and go to Matthew 21 if you would. What he's saying is, have you even changed what you believe? You're Pharisees, you're Sadducees, you're part of a false religion. Have you changed what you believe? Now, a lot of people will twist this to where John the Baptist is saying to the Pharisees, are you still living with your girlfriend? Now, that, nothing could be further from the context of the passage, right? Because there's no evidence that the Pharisees were into drinking or drugs. There's no evidence that they had long hair or were living in fornication with their girlfriend. What was the big problem with the Pharisees? That they don't believe the word of God. They don't believe in Christ. They don't believe John the Baptist. That was the repentance that needed to take place, was that they needed to change what they believe. And John said, I don't think you've changed what you believe. Show me some evidence that you've changed what you believe. And that's why he refused to baptize them. Now, uh, this, this uh, is laid out here in Matthew 21, verse 32. It says, For John came unto you in the way of righteousness, and you believed him not. But the publicans and the harlots believed him. And ye, when ye had seen it, repented not afterward that ye might believe him. Now, if you compare Matthew 21, go back to Mark 12, you'll realize that Matthew 21 and Mark 12 are the exact same time in Jesus' ministry. In fact, it's the same day. The same day are the events of Mark 12 and the events of Matthew 21. They're parallel passages. So what Jesus is telling them there is that you still don't believe in John the Baptist. You didn't believe him when he preached back then, and you still don't believe what John the Baptist preached. And Jesus confronting them with that again, saying, hey, the baptism of John, was it of heaven or was it from men? Now, they didn't believe John, but everybody around them did. So the, here's what they say. Look down at your Bible. In verse 31, they reason with themselves, saying, if we shall say from heaven, he will say, why then did you not believe him? 
Because it wouldn't make any sense to say, oh yeah, John the Baptist was a real prophet. He's a man of God. Okay, why didn't you believe in him? Why did he turn you away and not baptize you? Why did you never get baptized by John the Baptist? But they said, you know, if we shall say of men, verse 32, they feared the people for all men counted John that he was a prophet indeed. And they answered and said unto Jesus, we cannot tell. You know, like, we don't know. Because he put them in a position where they can't win. And Jesus answering, saith unto them, neither do I tell you by what authority I do these things. Now, here is a telltale sign of false prophets. They won't give a straight answer to a simple question. I mean, here's just a real simple question. Is John the Baptist a real prophet of God or not? Was his baptism from heaven? Was it something that God ordained? Or was it just of men? Was it just something that he made up? He just started dunking people in the water. And it was just something that he came up with. And they won't answer that very simple question because they're trying to please different groups of people and so forth. And it's the same way today when you ask a preacher a simple question and he won't give you an answer. You can't figure out where he stands. You know, I've walked up to a pastor and asked him just one of the most basic questions of all. I just said, you know, do you believe that a person can lose their salvation? And the guy took like a half hour to answer me. He drew a picture and drew a chart. And after literally drawing me two pictures and talking to me for about 25 minutes, maybe even 30 minutes, I could never quite figure out where he stood on it. And I kept trying to pin him down. And I'm like, well, let me get this straight. You know, what if I believe on Jesus Christ and then I go out and live a life of sin? You know, would I still be? Well, but no Christian would ever ask that question. You know, that, that, yeah, that, that, we shouldn't think that way. Here's how we should think about it. You know, it's just blah, blah, blah. Look, is it eternal or not? Can you lose it or not? Are we saved and eternally secure? Or is it conditional upon our obedience to the laws of God? Well, then salvation's by works. But, but pastors sometimes don't want to be pinned down on where they stand. You know, you ask them a simple question, you know, it, are you King James only? And they can't give a clear answer to that. Or you ask them a simple question of, you know, is abortion murder? And, you know, they don't want to give a clear answer to that. Uh, anytime somebody who's a man of God, so-called a pastor, will not just clearly state where he stands on important issues, that's a red flag right there. You know, why is he equivocating? Why, why won't he just let it be known? Jesus said, what you hear in the ear, he said, the, preach it upon the housetops. There's nothing concealed that shall not be revealed, he said. And so why would we try to hide what we believe? Now, false religions, though, they always hide what they believe. Think about the Mormons. They hide what they believe, right? It's all done in a secret ceremony, secret handshakes. The Mormons literally believe that you must know a secret handshake to get into heaven. But is that what they come and tell you at the door with the name tag? Hey, we're here to invite you to a religion where you get to heaven by learning a secret handshake. Because no one would listen to that because it sounds so bizarre and stupid. Because it is bizarre and stupid. But the reason that people fall for it is because they start out hiding that. And then they get you into it and they get you into it. And it gets weirder and weirder. And it's like the frog in the hot water. By the time you get to the weirdest parts, you're already so deep into it that you're not going to get out of it. In fact, a big part of the weirdness doesn't start until you get married. That's where they really bring out the weirdest doctrines. When you go to get married in the temple, that's where they start, you know, worshiping Lucifer. And that's where they start teaching you your handshakes and all that give you the, the weird underwear that you have to wear 24 hours a day, the special magical underwear that you wear 24-7. It's true. This is all fact about the Mormon church. But you don't find it out until you get married. And that's by design because they teach their people that if one of them, either husband or wife, wants to leave Mormonism and the other one wants to stay in, they'll divorce their spouse. They'll divorce. They'll say, well, you know what? If your husband's leaving the faith, you're not going to get to heaven unless you divorce him and marry a Mormon because you're relying on him to get you. So what they do is they get them sucked in. They ease them in. 
they start out by getting them in just with the social life and they focus more on Jesus and the Bible and everything like that and they hold off on some of the weirdest stuff. Then once they're already uh, in and they've got the social network and the friends and the family and then they get married, then they start getting weirder and weirder. But then it's like, well, wait a minute, if I back out now, am I going to lose my spouse? So usually when you'll see people leave the church of, uh, of uh, Latter-day Satan, I mean saints, then basically when they leave, they'll have to do it as a couple. They'll have to both talk about it and decide, oh man, you know, we need to get out of this, this cult, you know, that was started by Joseph Smith and Brigham Young. But, but it's hard for one of them to leave and the other one to stay in. Okay, but, but what does that show you about religions who hide what they believe? The more another one that will that will hide what they believe sometimes are the Jehovah's Witnesses. You know, they'll come and they, they, they won't really want to give straight answers to your questions when you ask them. Hey, do you believe this? Do you believe that? We as Christians, though, we should just proudly answer any question about the Bible. If we know the answer, if we know what we believe and not try to hide what we believe. There's nothing that we believe that should be hidden or concealed. We should just preach it from the housetops and just be, be, be proud of the Bible and not ashamed of Christ's words. But false prophets, they do things in the dark. Listen, any secret society is always wicked. Okay, the, the, the local Bible-believing church, everything's done in the open. It's all open, it's all exposed, there's nothing hidden, nothing secret. All secret societies, whether it's the Masons, whether it's the Ku Klux Klan, you know, whether it's the, I don't know, uh, the Illuminati. <laughs> what other secret societies are? The Skull and Bones, you know, and even these fraternities and things. Think about how weird these fraternities are. And the weird initiation and the hazing. All of these organizations, when they have secret societies and secret rituals and you get inducted and hazed and initiated, stay away from all of that stuff. Everything should be open to the light and we shouldn't be part of secretive organizations. And so uh, these people won't answer a simple question. Jesus basically makes a fool out of them. They come to confront him. Who do you think you are, buddy? And then he turns it around them and they kind of go away with their tail between their legs scared when it's all said and done. Okay, so let's go to Mark chapter 12. So Jesus really gets the best of them there at the end of chapter 11. So now they're going to try to get him back. You know, okay, you know, Jesus won, Pharisees zero. But, you know, we're going we're gonna to take this thing back. We're coming back. So it says in verse 13, they send unto him certain of the Pharisees and of the Herodians to catch him in his words. So basically they picked some of the, the sharpest, smartest people and they're going to trick him. They're going to trip him up and they're going to try a few things. So look what it says in verse 14. And when they were come, they say unto him, Master... We know that thou art true and carest for no man, for thou regardest not the person of man, but teachest the way of God in truth. Now, what do you notice that they're doing right away? Buttering him up. They're flattering him. And you should always beware of people who give you excessive compliments. And, and especially because these are his enemies. These aren't people that, you know, have been following him and, and loving his preaching. So these are his enemies, the, the, the Pharisees, and they come to him just praising him and telling him how wonderful he is because they're trying to get him off his guard so that they can trip him up. So then they ask this question, is it lawful to give tribute to Caesar or not? Now when they say is it lawful, they mean is it biblical is what they're asking. You know, according to the Bible, according to the Old Testament law, according to Moses, should we give tribute to Caesar or not? It says in verse 15, shall we give or shall we not give? And they're thinking like, <laughs> you know, we got him now, you know. He got us good on John the Baptist, but we're going we're gonna to really make him look bad. And uh, they're going to trick him. He says in verse number 15 there, but he knowing their hypocrisy, meaning he knew they didn't really want to know his opinion, but that they're just trying to get him in trouble. Knowing their hypocrisy, said to them, why tempt ye me? Bring me a penny that I may see it. And they brought it and he saith unto them, whose is this, this image and superscription? And they said unto him, Caesar's. And Jesus answering said unto them, Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And they marveled at him. Meaning they, they were amazed at how he basically answered the question in a way that was impossible for them to argue with. They can't really argue with that. It's his face on the coin, and he wants it back, then give it to him. And they're like, oh, uh, uh. 
then they look stupid in front of the people, you know, for, for asking that question. And because he rebuked them for their hypocrisy. Now, there, there are two teachings of the Lord Jesus Christ on taxes. The other one's found in Matthew 17. Go over to Matthew 17. This is earlier in the ministry of Jesus. Matthew 17 comes earlier than what we see in, in Mark 12, because Mark 12 is parallel with Matthew 21. But look, if you would, at Matthew 17, verse 24, it says, And when they were come to Capernaum, they that received tribute money, and, you know, tribute money is basically taxes, came to Peter and said, Doth not your master pay tribute? He saith, Yes. And when he was come into the house, Jesus prevented him, meaning that basically Jesus started speaking before Peter had a chance to say anything to Jesus. What thinkest thou, Simon, of whom do the kings of the earth take custom or tribute, of their own children or of strangers? Peter saith unto him, of strangers. Jesus saith unto him, then are the children free. Notwithstanding, lest we should offend them, go thou to the sea and cast an hook, and take up the fish that first cometh up, and when thou hast opened his mouth, thou shalt find a piece of money, that take and give unto them for me and thee. Now what Jesus is teaching here in Matthew 17 is that if we were truly free, we would not have to pay taxes if we were free. But basically the taxes are in place and he says, lest we offend them, you know, go take a piece of money for thee and for me. Now, some people will try to take a different interpretation of that passage and say that Jesus, you know, tells us not to pay taxes. Because there are a lot of people today who do not pay taxes and they say, Jesus never taught to pay taxes. Never taught that. We shouldn't pay taxes. There are a lot of people who say that. But if we look at these two scriptures, is Jesus in either of these two passages condemning someone for paying taxes? Is he ever saying, hey, if you pay taxes, you're not right with God? No, isn't he, in fact, saying just the opposite? Because in Matthew 17, he explains that philosophically he doesn't agree with the tax. Isn't that what he explained in Matthew 17? He's saying, you know, I shouldn't have to pay this, Peter. You shouldn't have to pay this. But we're going to pay it lest we offend them. You know, let's fast forward to 2014. Lest the IRS come to your house in the middle of the night with machine guns drawn. Because they do that, actually. Just ask Kent Hovind. You know, he didn't pay, and they came to his house in the middle of the night, you know, in, in bulletproof vests with assault rifles, and busted into his house in the middle of the night, ripped him out of bed, and he's been in prison for, you know, over eight years. So, yeah, the, basically, the IRS will come after you. They're very aggressive. They're ruthless. They'll talk to your neighbors. They'll tap your phone. They'll come after you hard. And if you don't pay the piper, you know, they're going to put you in prison. Now, there are some people who do get away with not paying taxes, but usually it's because it's not a large amount of money. You know, people who make very little money and it's not really a big deal to the IRS can sometimes get away with not paying taxes. But, uh, but here's the thing with, with Ken Hoven, we're talking about a guy who had hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars coming through his hands. They're going to pay attention to that because he had ministry so they're gonna pay attention to that they're gonna watch that you know and let me be clear you know I support brother Kent Hovind and you know I don't think he should be locked in a cage for the last eight years I don't believe that uh, he should be in prison and I believe that you know the justice system that put him there for so long and wants to just lock him up and throw away the key is is corrupt and obviously we should always stand with our brother in Christ against the world against the unbelievers of this world because he didn't, you know, cross the T and dot the I as far as the IRS is concerned, you know, I'm not going to condemn him for that because honestly, you know, our country is so corrupt and, and, and they tax us to death and whatever. But that being said, I'm not going down that route. I pay taxes. I pay my taxes uh, personally. When I ran a business, I paid business taxes because honestly, it's not worth going to prison over taxes. You say, oh, well, you know, I want to be like, uh, you know, uh, Paul Revere and Sam Adams and the people who, you know, started the American Revolution. But honestly, though, that's not really my calling in life. You know, I want to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. I want to serve God. I'd rather raise my family and pastor this church than to go to prison because of financial issues and political issues and taxation issues. It's not worth it for me. Now, look, do I believe that our taxation in America is out of control? 
Yeah, I'm like Jesus, where I look at it and I say, you know, we shouldn't have to pay this. This isn't freedom when 40% of our money or 50% of our money is going to the government to be spent on things that we don't even believe in. But at the end of the day, I am not willing, and people can condemn what they want, I'm not willing to go to prison over taxes. Now, I am willing to go to prison over preaching this book. I mean, if they make a law against preaching any one page of this book, I don't care what page that is, I will continue to preach that page, and I will preach the whole counsel of God, and if they say, hey, it's illegal to preach against homosexuality, I'm going to keep on preaching against homosexuality. And if they say, hey, it's illegal to preach that you should spank your kids, I'm going to keep on preaching that you should spank your kids, and I'm not going to let them intimidate me from preaching the Bible, but if they want a Federal Reserve note that's got Alexander Hamilton's face on it, you know, give it back to Alexander Hamilton, the central banker and let him have his money then render unto Alexander Hamilton the things that be Alexander Hamilton's and unto God the things that be God's not that these Federal Reserve notes even have any real value anyway it only has value in our imagination anyway so we might as well give it back to him and they can take it to hell with them for all I care you know they so what because you know what we should be more concerned with winning souls preaching the gospel, raising our families, and so on and so forth. And look, I'm all for being politically active. If you want to fight the freedom fight and fight for liberty, great, but it's not worth going to prison over. That's where I stand. You don't agree with it? Fine. You know, and I, and you know, I think I say that since I even had my face bashed in by the police, you know, standing up for, for my Fourth Amendment rights. So, you know, I believe in fighting for freedom. But I don't believe in, in, you know, not paying taxes and going to prison. I don't think it's worth it. I don't think it makes sense. And I don't, think, I don't think Jesus wants us to do it because he never told us to do it. Show me one scripture where he says, don't pay taxes. And here he says, you know, render unto Caesar the things that be Caesar's and unto God the things that be God's. And you say, well, but it's not Caesar's, it's mine. He just said, whose face is on the money? And, and look one of these bozos is on every single denomination of the money. True or false? If it's not Ulysses S. Grant, it's Benjamin Franklin. And if it's not Benjamin Franklin, it's Alexander Hamilton or Abraham Lincoln or George Washington. You know, or if you have the coins, it could be, you know, John F. Kennedy, for example. You know, and that's all I can think of right now of people. Thomas Jefferson's on one of the coins, right? Whatever. It, it, it's not important. It's not worth it. And so do I support people who are brothers and sisters in Christ who've gotten in trouble with the IRS because of all the stupid laws and technicalities? Of course I support them and will stand with them and, and, and try to get them, you know, free out of prison and try to try to uh, encourage them and be a blessing. Them. And I would not condemn them or judge them. But me personally, I'm going to pay the tax you know, that, that they say that I owe just so that they don't come kill me or put me in a cage for the next eight years, okay? And I suggest that you do the same thing. You know, do what you want, but, you know, you can't prove it scripturally that we should be uh, not paying taxes. So anyway, they're, they're trying to catch him up, and, and he, again, just blows them out of the water. So the Pharisees couldn't really trip him up, so now the Sadducees, they're going to take a crack at it. Move over, Pharisees. We, we got this. You know, we're going we're gonna to show him now. So it says in verse 18, Then come unto him the Sadducees, which say there is no resurrection. And they asked him, saying, Master, Moses wrote unto us, If a man's brother die, and leave his wife behind him, and leave no children, that his brother should take his wife and raise up seed unto his brother. Now there were seven brethren, and the first took a wife, and dying left no seed. And the second took her and died, neither left he any seed. And the third likewise. And the seven had no seed. Last of all, the woman died also. In the resurrection, therefore, when they shall rise, whose wife shall she be of them? For the seven had her to wife. So they bring up this bizarre hypothetical situation. And by the way, people will always hit you with these weird hypothetical situations. It's always ridiculous. You know, this woman marries a guy, he dies, so then she marries the brother, he dies, she marries the brother, he dies. You know, this was like Elizabeth Taylor's role model, apparently. Seven husbands, you know, in a row. So, you know, instead of seven brothers, you know, it's just one bride for all seven of them. I mean, could such a thing really happen? 
that she just goes to all seven guys. I mean, it's just, it's a strange scenario given here. But these hypotheticals that people hit you with, just we were out soul winning today and, and one of the groups that was out soul winning, you know, a guy hit him with, what about these people out in the jungle that have never heard of Jesus? That's a favorite, the, the famous, you know, one. Well, here's the thing. If anybody ever met that guy, he'd no longer be that guy. You know, because he'd be coming in contact with Christians now. So this guy, we just have to believe that this guy exists. And he's usually in Africa, right? What about the guy that's deep in Africa and he's never heard the gospel, he's never heard of Jesus? But here's the funny thing about that. I think probably people in Africa have heard of Jesus more than any other continent because there are more missionaries in Africa than anywhere else in the world. And there are tons of Christians in all parts of Africa and tons of missionaries. And so, you know, this guy doesn't even exist, but it's always a hypothetical. You know, or you, you try to condemn sodomy. You know, what about people with both? You know, just the stupid, bizarre hypotheticals. And so they're hitting him with this crazy story. But of course, they show their lack of understanding. Look what Jesus answers in verse 24. Jesus answering said unto them, Do you not therefore err because you the scriptures, neither the power of God? Now notice, when people are in error, it's usually because they don't know the scriptures. He says, look, you err not knowing the scriptures. If we're going to be error-free in our doctrine, we better know the scriptures. Because error comes from a lack of knowing the Bible. That's why most people are in error. Now, there are false teachers out there that just maliciously, purposely teach lies. But most of the people in the pew in these churches aren't just evil people. They just don't know the scriptures. And if we don't, it's like I preach on Sunday night. If you don't know the scriptures... You're going to be tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine. And so Jesus says, you err not knowing the scriptures, neither the power of God. For when they shall rise from the dead, listen to this, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels which are in heaven. So the Bible's real clear that marriage ends at death. That's why we say when we get married, till death do us part. So my wife and I will not be married to each other for all of eternity. Now, the Mormon church, again, let's get on them tonight. You know, we live in the second largest Mormon population in the world. Did you know that? Because the biggest is Salt Lake City, and then Mesa, Arizona is number two, and then Gilbert, Arizona also. I don't want to leave you out. But Gilbert, Arizona, there are so many Mormons. They err not knowing the scriptures. They think that they're going to be, and I showed this to a Mormon. Because I was, I was giving the gospel to this Mormon lady, and, uh, you know, we were talk we got to talking somehow, and I said somehow to this Mormon lady, uh, I said, you know, we believe that, you know, marriage is till death do us part, and that, and that, you know, we don't believe in divorce. You know, we believe that we should stay married. And this is what she said. She said, oh, yeah? Well, we believe it goes even beyond death, so that's even worse. And I was thinking, like, you know, I wouldn't want my wife saying that it's worse to be with me for all, I hope my wife loves me. I mean, I hope my wife is disappointed. Right, honey, that it ends at death? Yeah, see, see, did you see how vigorously she was nodding her head just now? You know, but the, she said like, oh man, it's even worse with us. Well, you know, personally, I like being married. I want to be with my wife for my whole life, but apparently not so much with this lady. But she said, you know, it's even worse with us because it even goes beyond death. It's forever and ever and ever. So she didn't say it like that, but, but I showed her this verse. I pulled out the Bible and I said, well, look, what about this right here? You're erring not knowing the scriptures because in the resurrection, they neither marry or are given to marriage. Wh which of the seven? I mean, she was married to seven guys. Which one's she going to be married to up in heaven, in the next world, in the resurrection? And he says, none of them, because in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are or like the angels uh, in heaven. Then he turns it around and then he's going to blow them out of the water now. So he, he basically, he evaded, you know, they came at him, you know, and he blocked that one. And then now he comes in with his move and it says right here, you know, as touching the dead that they rise, have ye not read in the book of Moses how in the bush God spake unto him saying, I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. Ye therefore do greatly err. You guys are really because of the fact that you think Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are just dead. 
But God said hundreds of years after they died physically, I am the God of Abraham. I am the God of Isaac. I am the God. Of he's not the God of the dead. He's the God of the living. That's why Jesus also said, Abraham rejoiced to see my day and was glad. So Abraham is alive and well. Isaac and Jacob are alive because their bodies are dead, but their souls are alive in heaven. And their bodies will rise again. There will be a resurrection where their bodies will rise and, and be changed and glorified in the moment in a twinkling of an eye. Now, it's, it's interesting because so, someone asked me the question recently of, you know, in the millennium, because in the millennium, we're going to be ruling and reigning with Christ Jesus. And also even beyond the, the millennium, in the new heaven and the new earth, the Bible teaches that we shall reign forever and ever. And somebody asked the question, what about women? You know, will women be ruling and reigning in the millennium or is it just going to be the men that are ruling and reigning? Because obviously the Bible's real clear that today in this present world, men are to be in authority in the home. You know, the husband's the head of the wife and the wife's to obey the husband. Also in the church, the Bible says, I suffer not a woman to teach nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. Adam was first formed, then Eve. Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. And then obviously he says, let the women keep silence in the churches. So at this time, women do not rule over men. Men are in charge in the home. The husband's in charge in the church. The pastor's a man. The deacons are men. Okay. Uh, and even in the political realm, we should have men ruling over us according to the Bible. And it's not that women have any less value than men, but they have a different role and a different function that they are not to be in positions of authority. Now, they do have authority over their children, of course, but not over their husband, not over the church, not over the nation. But here's the thing. I actually, and it's hard to say 100% just because the Bible does not specifically deal with this subject, but I would say that women will rule and reign with Christ. And here's because first of all, in the resurrection, there's no marriage. So there's not going to be a husband that they are, are, are basically subject unto or submissive unto. There's no marriage. But not only that, Eve was not placed under Adam's authority until the fall when they sinned. Do you remember that? Because if you remember before that, you know, Adam and Eve are in the garden and everything's great. But then once they sinned, there was a curse placed upon the man and a curse placed upon the woman. And the curse upon the man was that he was going to have to work by the sweat of his face and toil and, and suffer. And he's going to be thrown out of the garden and have to work really hard to make a living. And then he said unto the woman, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow shalt thou bring forth children and thy desire shall be to thy husband and he shall rule over thee. So the whole statement that the husband would rule over his wife was a result of the, the fall of, of uh, Adam and Eve, that's when God ordained that the man would be in authority and, the, and that the woman would be subject unto him within marriage. So therefore, if we're in the resurrection and there's no more, we don't have any more sin, you know, that would be my inclination would be to believe that, you know, even women will rule and reign with the Lord Jesus Christ in the millennium and beyond. But again, I could be wrong, but that's what I believe. And I'm the most misogynistic, male chauvinist uh, pastor in America. So that, you know, that means something coming from me. All right, ladies. But anyway, uh, let's, let's look down at the Bible here. In verse number 28, it says, And one of the scribes came, and having heard them reasoning together and perceiving that he had answered them well, asked him, Which is the first commandment of all? So he notices that they're trying to stump him. They can't stump him. They can't uh, uh, resist what he's saying. He always gets the better of them. So then the scribe wants to ask him a question. And I think this guy's actually sincere because of the answer that he gets. So this guy basically sees that he's answering them well. So I think he's asking this question because he actually just wants to know the answer. You know, because there are two kinds of people who ask you questions. Some people want to know the answer. Other people are just trying to stump you, trying to trick you, trying to trick you, trying to fool you. So he comes to him and says, which is the first commandment of all? And Jesus answered him, the first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart 
and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. And the second is like, namely this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none other commandment greater than these. And the scribe said unto him, Well, master, thou hast said the truth. For there is one God, and there is none other but he. And to love him with the, all the heart, and with all the understanding, with all the soul, and with all the strength, and to love his neighbor as himself is more than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. And when Jesus saw that he answered discreetly, meaning that he answered wisely, he said unto him, Thou art not far from the kingdom of God. And no man after that durst ask him any question. Durst means they dared not. Nobody even dared to ask him a question because they did not want to be made to look foolish. So they would not, no one would even have the guts to ask him a question after that. Now, a lot of people will misinterpret this. Go to uh, Romans 13. Romans 13 is a good place that explains this thing of what is the greatest commandment. Romans 13. Because remember, the Bible said that the greatest commandment was to, the first commandment, the most important commandment, was to love God, right? And of course, he, 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 he expresses how much we should love God, you know, with all our mind, all our strength, all our, all our heart. And then he says the second commandment, the second greatest, is to love our neighbor as ourself. These two, there's no other greater commandment than these two commandments. Now, a lot of people will take this and just say, those are the only, they'll say those are the only commandments we need. And then what they'll say is that, you know, hey, we shouldn't worry so much about all the do's and don'ts of the Bible. Just as long as we love people, just as long as we love God and love our brothers and sisters, you know what? We don't have to worry about all these rules and, you know, try to figure out what God wants us to do and all, all you know, all these do's and don'ts. And, you know, that's why people are leaving churches today, because there's just too many do's and don'ts, too much religion, you know, just too much, too much legalistic preaching. All we need is just love, love, love. But let's read Romans 13 and get this in perspective why Jesus is saying that's the greatest commandment and why there's none other greater commandment than these. Look what the Bible says. Like, first of all, just common sense would tell you, just because they're the greatest commandment, that doesn't mean it's the only commandment, number one. Just because something's the most important thing doesn't mean it's the only thing. I mean, think about that. The most important thing is to love God. The second most important thing is to love our neighbor. But he didn't say that's all that matters. He just said those are the top two things. But watch this, though, in Romans 13, because it's explained very well here in verse 8. Owe no man anything but to love one another, for he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. Watch the explanation. For this, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, Thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet. And here's the key. If there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. Now, in that scripture, we have the explanation that according to the Bible, if we truly love our neighbor, we will follow the commandments of God. Because he said, if we love our neighbor, we're not going to kill him. If we love our neighbor, we're not going to steal from him. If we love our neighbor, we're not going to bear false witness about him. If we love our neighbor, we're not going to commit adultery with his wife. We're not going to look upon his wife to lust after her. If we love our neighbor, we're not going to covet and desire the goods that belong to our neighbor. If we love him, we're just going to be happy that he has that stuff. So think about that. He's saying, he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. And he didn't just list those five. He said, if there be any other commandment. So what the Bible is really teaching is that when we break God's commandments, we're proving that we don't love our neighbor. And we're proving that we don't love God. That's why the Bible says, this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous. He says in 1 John 5, 3, for this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous. He also says again in 2 John, and this is love 
that we walk after his commandments. And this is his commandment that as you've heard from the beginning, you should walk in it. So how do we show love for our neighbor? Just because we feel loving? No, we show it by doing what's right by our neighbor. By walking righteously by our neighbor in God's opinion. And how do we show our love for God? Jesus said, if you love me, if you love me, keep my commandments. So see how foolish it is to say, well, as long as you love God and love your neighbor, it's okay if you violate the do's and don'ts. You know, just, just don't worry so much about the do's. I mean, just, just put that away. Look, put, put away the Bible. Put that book away. Put away the doctrine. Let's just love. Let's just have a love night. <laughs> we're going to have a Wednesday night love service. And we're just going to get together and just the love. <laughs> But here's the thing. It'd make more sense to get together and learn the doctrine and learn the commandments because then we can actually show God that we love him. And we actually show our neighbor that we love him because we're keeping his commandments, because we're not stealing and ripping people off and, and coveting and lusting. Look, do I love my wife if I'm committing adultery or coveting another man's wife? That shows I don't love my neighbor because my wife is my neighbor too. So all of these commandments that are in the Bible are going to fall under one of two categories. Love God or love your neighbor. You're either, when you do wrong, when you sin, You're either sinning against God or you're sinning against another person or both. So that's why God says, look, if you just love God and love your neighbor, you'll walk according to his commandments and you'll do right by people and you'll do right by God. So that's why Jesus said, you know, that's the greatest commandment is to love God. And the second one is to love your neighbor as yourself. He's not saying those commandments are great and just don't worry about everything else. Because honestly, if you get those two right, you'll automatically, you'll automatically obey the other commandments because of the fact that love does no ill to his neighbor. Look what it says there in Romans 13, if you're still there. It says, love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Love is the fulfilling of the law. Because why did God give us the laws that, that are in the Bible? So that we won't hurt other people, so that we won't do ill unto our neighbor. Because stealing, killing, lying, committing adultery, fornicating. These are all things that hurt other people. They do hurt others. And that's why God doesn't want us to do them because he wants us to do right by our neighbor and love our neighbor. And he wants us to love him. And if you think about it, the five commandments that he listed there in the category of loving your neighbor are the last five of the 10 commandments. He listed the last five. Well, if you think about it, the first five have to do with our relationship with God. And then the latter five have to do with our relationship with our fellow man. Remember, they're on two tablets. And so uh, they all hang, the law and the prophets all hang on love God and love your neighbor. That's how it would be stated in its shortest form. But that doesn't mean we should throw away our Bibles and just write that on a three by five card. All right, everybody, open your Bibles and we all pull out a three by five card that just has these two verses on it. Just Mark, it just has Mark 12, 30 and 31. You know, well, we'll include verse 29 too. You know, it'll fit on a three by five. And that's our whole Bible. No, he gave us the whole Bible for a reason. So we can learn how to love God. Right. And so we can learn how to love our neighbor because the commandments will teach us how to do that according to the Bible. So let's keep reading here. He tells this guy, you know, this guy gives a smart answer, a, a correct answer. And Jesus tells him, thou art not far from the kingdom of God. So Jesus is complimenting this man for having the wisdom to accept his answer. And so he tells him, thou art not far from the kingdom of God. Now it's funny because it says at the end of verse 34, no man after that durst ask him any questions. So everybody's afraid to ask him another question. Oh, but he's not through yet. He's like, oh, you're not going to ask me any more questions, huh? Well, I'm, I'm not done showing the world what a bunch of false prophets you are. So now I'm going to stump you. Now I'm going to start asking you questions. And so he asks them, you know, what say ye of, of, uh, of David? Whose son is he? But in, in Mark, it's stated this way. Jesus answered and said, well, he taught in the temple, verse 35, uh, Mark 12. How say the scribes that Christ is the son of David? Here's a question for you. Why are the scribes teaching that Jesus Christ, or, or not Jesus Christ, because they don't believe in Jesus, but... How are they saying that Christ or the Messiah is the son of David? For David himself said by the Holy Ghost, the Lord said to my Lord, 
Sit thou on my right hand till I make thine enemies thy footstool. David therefore himself calleth him Lord. Whence is he then his son? And the common people heard him gladly. The common people are loving it. The religious people are like, oh, he's saying that we're wrong, you know, because they've been teaching lies, that's why. And so uh, he, he stumps them. You know, why is he not considered the son of David? Well, physically he's of David, but because Jesus was in the beginning with God and he was God. Right. This is another great scripture on the deity of Christ because it's showing that he's not just a descendant of David, but he actually was in the beginning with God and he was God. That's why Jesus said, before Abraham was, I am. Before Abraham was, I am. So what he's saying is, how could he be the son of David when he was before David, when he created David and when David calls him Lord? And this is why it rubs me the wrong way when the Catholics call Mary the mother of God. That's not accurate. Now Mary was, the, but this is their logic. Well, Mary's the mother of Jesus, and Jesus is God, therefore Mary's the mother of God. So I can see where they're getting that logic, because that does make sense logically. But here's the problem with their argument, is that Jesus was man as well as being God. He was not just God. Jesus was 100% God, but he was also 100% man. Jesus was a human being. That's the mystery of godliness. That's the, the amazing thing about the deity of Christ, is that he could be both God and man. He's the son of God, but he's also called the son of man. And uh, Jesus, you can see his humanity when he's, when he's crying and weeping and he doesn't want to go through with the cross because, you know, it's going to be too, it's going to be hard. And he says, not my will, but thine be done. So Jesus, both human and God. So Mary was not the mother of him as God. She was just his earthly mother. So Mary's the earthly mother. And saying Mary is the mother of God implies that Mary came before God. And in fact, God came way before Mary and God created Mary and so forth. That's why, and I think this scripture, I've even pointed Catholics to this scripture when they say Mary is the mother of God. Because I'm saying, I show, well, you know, Christ here isn't even the son of David, according to Jesus, in the sense that he's the Lord. Now, in a human sense, he was the son of David, but in the sense that he's the Lord, He's not, because he came before David, he created David. How is he then his son? Okay, so anyway, he's stumping them and, and confusing them with that. Now, how many of you today have a King James Bible that says in Mark 12, 36, the word Lord in all capital letters in the second line? Put up your hand. Okay, now, how many of you today have a King James Bible that in Mark 12, 36 does not say Lord in all capitals. It's lowercase. Well, it's a capital L, but it's, it's yeah, but it's okay, yeah. Now, did you notice that about 90 some percent of people had it with the all caps? Mine has all caps. I've rarely seen a Bible that doesn't, but did you know that that is a typo? That is, a, that is actually a typo. <laughs> but here's the thing though. God never promised to preserve spellings and capitalizations and punctuations. And this is just, I point that out to show you that every single King James Bible that I've ever seen or owned has some typo in it. If you read the Bible long enough, you'll find a typo. Anybody who reads a lot of Bible and they have a lot of Bibles at home, you'll find a typo eventually in your Bible. And 90 some percent of the people in the room tonight have a typo in their Bible. You say, well, how do you know that's a typo? Well, first of all, because the capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D is meant to represent the Tetragrammaton, which is only found in the Old Testament, number one. Number two, we have a replica of the 1611 King James Bible back there, and it is not in all capitals in the original 1611 edition. This is a typo that was in... Now, where did this typo come from? This is a quote from the Old Testament. So whoever was putting this Bible together, when they pasted it in from the Old Testament, they basically just kept it in, you know, for some reason they just said, well, it's capital in the Old Testament. Somebody just thought, well, if it's capital in the Old Testament, we better put a capital in the New Testament. But that's, that's really not correct because it, does, it isn't any different word in the Greek than when it's in lowercase. So this is an error to have it in all capitals. Now you say, Pastor Harris, are you saying there's errors in the Bible? No, here's what I'm saying. Everybody listen very carefully. Capitalizations don't matter. 
Everybody get that real clearly? Because a lot of people will say, oh man, these King James, some of these King James are corrupt because they don't capitalize the S in spirit or they do capitalize the S in spirit and blah, blah, blah. Look, what is it that we're supposed to live by? Every word. It's the word. Is Lord the same word, whether it's in all caps or not? So there's not some mistake in your Bible and, oh, man, let's freak out and, and, you know, we don't trust our Bible anymore. It's just a capitalization. It's just a punctuation. But people will use these discrepancies, so-called, to try to make you think, oh, the King James Bible keeps changing. People will lie. Yes. Listen, there's a reason why we have that big replica of the King James back there. You know why we have it back there? Because people are constantly lying yes. and saying, oh, the King James Bible is constantly changing. Oh, it's been changed 10 times. It's been revised four different times. It's been revised 100 times. They've made 31,000 changes and 15,000 changes. Do I, listen to me. If you believe, and they'll tell you, oh, the 1611 is nothing like what you're reading. You want to know the difference between that 1611 back there on the table and the one that you have in your lap? The differences are it's in a different font. It's in a very different font. Okay? It has different spellings. It has different punctuation. And get this, the capitalizations are very different. Very different. The capitalizations in that 1611 edition are going to be extremely different. There's going to be about two or three times as wor many words capitalized in that thing as, as in your modern day King James. But you know what's going to be the same between the 1611 and the one you have in your hand? The words. The words are the same. That's what matters. So don't get hung up on, oh, well, you know, the King James has been changed because spirit lowercase instead of uppercase spirit. Well, remember the word of God was spoken. Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And when people speak, you can't see capitals. I mean, when Jesus said, David himself said by the Holy Ghost, the Lord said unto my Lord. Do you think he stopped and said like, now, the Lord said unto my Lord. The Lord said unto my Lord. No, because capitalizations don't matter. Okay? And are there discrepancies in capitalization between the 1611 and the... Of course, because the rules of grammar and the rules of spelling... So you have different punctuation, different spellings, different letters. So don't let people get you sucked into this. Oh, is it the Oxford or the Cambridge? It's both. They're both fine. They both say the same thing. There is no meaningful difference between the Oxford and the Cambridge edition. None. Zero. Oh, here's a list of 12 differences. Lowercase s here. Yeah, it's like, oh, good night. You look at all 12, they're all bogus. We, we had a scene on that for New World Order Bible versions, and it ended up on the cutting room floor, and I was because I get so sick of, you know, we had a scene where we went through the, the 12 and showed, you know. But of course, you know, the movie's already too long. You know, we got to edit it down. But honestly, uh, these spellings, punctuation, capital, don't get hung up on them. It's what is the word saying? What do the words say? That's what matters. And just the proof right here is that 90-some percent of King James Bibles have a typo in this verse. Does it matter? Does it change the meaning? Is any meaning changed by that typo? No. But it's not correct because that is not the tetragrammaton underlying that. It's the same Greek word as the other Lord in the same verse that's in all lowercase. So it's a, it's a typo. But, you know, you'll find in that 1611 edition, you'll find lots of typos. Because back then they didn't have computers and they were doing it by hand. A lot of the typesetting and there's typos. But just because a book has typos in it, it doesn't mean that it's not the word of God. Okay, the translation is perfect, it's, it's the same as the original, but each individual copy is going to have typos in it. But here's the thing about typos, aren't they always obvious? You know, now in this case, it's not obvious, but that's because it's not meaningful. But in other cases, you know, typos will be obvious. Like a lot of times, instead of saying you, I've had a King James where in one place instead of saying you, it said yo. Like they just left off the you. But you look at it and you immediately, okay, it's a typo. Or like in the King James 1611 edition, you'll be reading in Exodus and there's a place where one line is just, a couple lines are just repeated. And it's just the same line again. And you, you know, you can just tell, okay. But you know what, people will try to compare that with like what the NIV does to the Bible. It's apples to oranges, my friend. So anyway, not trying to 
to go real deep or confuse you, but I just wanted to point that out to you uh, in verse 36 that that uh, should not be all caps like that. It's just, a it's just a typographical error that's in modern King James Bibles for some reason, but it doesn't really change the meaning. The thing I want to point out in this chapter, and then we'll go, it says in verse 38, And he said unto them in his doctrine, Beware of the scribes. Man, he is just hitting these people hard. He's just humiliating them, uh, you know, making them look foolish with questions and answers and defeating them. Now he's just, he's not done with them. He says, Beware of the scribes. And he says, Here's how you'll know which people to beware of. Which love to go in long clothing. Notice how false prophets will often go in long clothing. They'll wear these robes. We saw some woman at the park on Sunday baptizing a baby with sprinkling. She's by Kiwanis Lake, giant body of water. And she's sprinkling, you know. But, but what's she wearing? Long clothing. What does the Catholic priest wear? Long clothing. You know, these long flowing robes. But isn't it funny how they always portray Jesus with long clothing? Now, do you really think Jesus is wearing long clothing and then preaching like, Beware of the scribes. They love to wear long clothing. Do you think, and, but, but he's wearing long clothing while he said that. Who believes that? I don't. Well, then what, can you tell that to every single uh, Sunday school literature artist in the world? <laughs> but anyway, not, sorry to confuse you with the facts there. But uh, beware of the scribes which love to go in long clothing. Well, Jesus just went in long clothing. He just didn't love it. Come on, get real. He didn't wear long clothing. It's always been the aristocratic, the rulers, people who are very full of themselves, who love to go in long clothing. We're, we're, talk, we're, not, we're not talking about women, we're talking about men. I mean, look, I, I don't think we could find a man in this room who's in long clothing tonight. Who's it? Is there any man here that's in long clothing? Does anybody have a jacket on that basically goes to their feet? Or a robe or a coat that goes down to their feet? I don't see any. But the Catholics will do it. The Muslim imam will do it. Monks and other clergy type people will do the long clothing. You know, this is a Baptist outfit. Short clothing, right? Shirt just, just stops right here. None of this long flowing garments of the Pharisees. He says, they love to go in long clothing and they love salutations in the marketplaces. What does that mean? They love to dress in such a way where everybody sees them. Oh, Father so-and-so. Oh, Rabbi and greet them everywhere they go. They love those greetings and to be exalted of men. And it says, they love salutations in the marketplace and the chief seats in the synagogues and the uppermost rooms at feasts, which devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayers. These shall receive the greater damnation. Now look, over and over in Mark 11 and Mark 12, Jesus is rebuking and attacking false religion, isn't he? point he gets specific yeah I don't even like their clothes and they're so full of themselves and they love to be greeted everywhere that they go and they're lying and preaching false doctrine but then today's preachers don't want to go after false prophets and false religion I mean I've even heard I've even been in a church where they didn't even want to name Mormonism they're like now there's a certain false religion and I don't want to name it but you know this religion thinks that you know you're gonna be married for all eternity and these are good people, and we love them, and I don't want to name the name of that religion, but they're wrong. No, Jesus would name it. You know, and, and, and we ought to name it as well. Jesus was at war with false religion and false teaching, and we ought to be as well. And he, he told, and you say, well, why? What's the point? Because Jesus said, beware. Yep. We are to warn people about the lies and false teaching that's out there so that they're not sucked in by it. That's the purpose of preaching against these other religions, to warn people. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you so much, Lord, for your word, and we thank you for uh, what we can learn from Mark chapter 12 tonight, Lord. Help us as we continue to study the book of Mark and, and to learn about your ministry, Lord, just to take an, an example from it, to learn from your wisdom and, and the way that you handled things, Lord. Help us to uh, follow in your steps, be like you, and in Jesus' name we pray, amen.